All right. Regarding the midterm, I do not yet have the midterms finished. I'm going to make every effort to get those done prior to Wednesday's class. Um, and something I'll say now and something I'll say when I hand back the midterm is you have to take the grade, your course grade, with a grain of salt in the course shell or the Blackboard Learn, whatever you want to call it, because the way that grading spreadsheet works is, um, if you recall, minor deliverables are worth, uh, it's like quizzes and so forth are worth 10%, minor deliverables are worth 30, and then the remaining 60 is major deliverables, at least that's my memory. Maybe it's uh, 40 and 50, but let's run with 60. So if major deliverables are worth 60, and that, that would be four projects plus a midterm and a final, so think 10% each, all that grading spreadsheet can do is calculate your grade based on what's been accomplished so far. So when you get your grade back on your midterm, it is going to, in that spreadsheet, it's going to account for, assuming that project one has not been graded yet, it's going to account for 60% of your grade, right? So if you did really well on the midterm, it didn't, did really horrible on everything else, you're going to be boosted way up because you got a really good score accounting for 60%, and vice versa. If you get a bad score on the midterm, it's going to make your, your grade look really crappy. But as you complete, as major, as the projects are graded, uh, then that portion of your course grade shrinks that, uh, for that midterm. Okay, So just keep in mind that that's how the math is working for the, the course shell uh, when you get that midterm grade. Um, so again, I, I hope to have that done by Wednesday. I posted assignment 7. Those of you in lab today were able to start working on that. There are some items I wanted to talk about which are required uh, technically to complete that assignment uh, that I haven't talked about, so I want to do that. Also, I do want to get a, a content overview and a, a quiz up, and I haven't gotten those up. Uh, the content overview, I think, is going out is going to be a lot of review things you should be doing. Uh, so it's not not critical necessarily. But before I dive into all that, does anyone have any questions for me? All right, then I'll dive right into that. Actually, yeah, go ahead. Um, when I'm logging into my Jaguar account at home. It says, you know, make sure that you're not going over your disk quota and so on and so forth. Use check disk to manage whatever. Right. I'm just wondering, like, how do you tell, like, when you're approaching your quota? And, uh, okay, so the question is regarding the, your disk allotment quota on Jaguar and how you can manage that. So I do not have a quota on Jaguar, uh, and so I can't hit my quota as a, an example, but I can show you things that you can do. Uh, the, the one thing that I do, well, let me see. If I type du minus h, that uh, stands for disk usage. And the H is in human readable form. Uh, if I don't put the dash H, I get the same output, except note this. This is basically saying that I've got 332 megabytes. If I do that without the dash H, then it's giving me a number in a uh, number of disk blocks. Looks like uh, one disk block is a, a K here. So that. Uh, anyway, if you do it minus H, that's going to give it to you. So what, what, is your, what is your quota? Do you know what the quota is? Um, is it uh, like 10 meg or something like that? Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can see what, what it 
how much is being taken up. Note that I'm in my home directory. If I go into a directory, it's basically going to compute disk usage from your current directory on down. So you're going to get the most accurate reading of that by being in your home directory where you are when you log in. Now another thing you can do, you may be interested, maybe you're approaching the quota or actually over the quota and you want to identify where the pig is taking up all your space. Uh, what I would do is I'd type du and then I'd type this. So what this recipe is saying is you want to run the disk usage command and then you're going to take the output of that disk usage command and you're going to sort it. And the dash n means sort it numerically as opposed to sorting it alphabetically. And so what that will do is that will put the smallest numbers early on and the biggest numbers lower down, which is precisely what you want. So you want, when this thing's done running the command, what you want sitting on your screen are those directories and files that are comprising most of your disk usage. So if I do that and hit return, Again, this is, uh, I'm not doing the human readable form because that's going to mess up the, the numeric sorting algorithm. So I don't have the dash H here because I'm not concerned with what the number, what, how much space is being taken. I'm concerned with, relatively speaking, what's taking up most space. So it looks like my Python directory is taking up a fair amount of space and then things really jump here. Whatever this dot KDE is, is taking up a bunch of space. And uh, if you didn't know what KDE was, you ask me or someone who does know. And if you decide you don't need that, then you go in there and you remove it all. Uh, this is, you can see that this KDE directory contains a number of directories in there. And so based on what you know now, that's actually a really uh, labor-intensive task to go into each of these directories and remove everything and then go up a directory and remove the empty directory and so forth. Uh, the, there is an option which stands for recursive, that's minus R with RM, and then I can provide the name of the directory and it will remove that directory, all of its contents, on down the hierarchy. So everything in KDE on down, it's going to delete. Uh, things like this are not recommended. That means see whatever's in your home directory, remove it all, and if there are any directories in there, go on down them and remove them all. And let me carefully comment that out so before I hit return inadvertently. Uh, but that that should be enough, I think, for you to go ahead and manage your disk usage. Isn't the KDE your OS? The KDE is a windowing system. So the shape of the windows, where it's putting these little dealy dots here, how it's looking, the kinds of menus it's producing, that's all part of the graphical user interface. And um, recall that, that Unix and Linux are first and foremost a, an operating system where your primary interface is the command line. So the graphical interface is, is something separate that sits on top. So you find... Uh, KDE is really popular. GNOME is another really popular one, uh, but there are you know half a dozen or a dozen of them to choose from. So as you get as you get to know Linux more and more, you end up customizing your environment more and more to suit your personal tastes. Yes. If you did end up deleting KDE, how would that affect your operating system? It would, so again, this is a directory in my home directory, and the reason it is in my home directory is that uh, it is just the settings I have for my user interface. So again, this isn't set at an operating system level, this is set at a user level. So if you're sitting, you could be sitting logged into Jaguar on those computers in the other room, and you have one graphical look, and I can have a totally different graphical look. So it's not tied to the operating system, it's tied to personal preference, although everyone's defaulting to the same one. Uh, the effect on me for removing this, this .kde here is uh, not critical information, it's primarily configuration information, so if I was to delete all of that, then what would happen is the next time I logged in, presumably using the KDE interface, anything that I had personalized would be gone, and we'd, I'd start with kind of the generic look and feel of it. So I mean, it, the bottom line is it really isn't critical and it's not going to hurt much. Any other questions? 
Okay. So I think it's 200 megs. 200 megs is your... Maybe. Uh, you can find out real quick. You do something like this. Do cat it. See, just pick a file and append it to something in your home directory. Done. That'll run it forever until you fill up, in my case, fill up the disk drive. In your case, until you hit your... I don't know why you'd want to do it, but, you know, curiosity is... Uh, uh, so this looks like a utility that the administrator created. Yeah, you can see that I don't have any quota limits, so... Yeah, so you can see uh, what you can see here is that this configuration directory for Firefox ends up eating a bunch of information. It caches images and stuff as you surf around the web. So that's happening so frequently with students hitting their quota that the administrators offered this helpful hint here. And here you see the hint that's being offered. Uh, we want to recursively move this Firefox directory and everything under this Firefox directory inside the .mozilla directory. And now it's giving me, what is it doing here? It looks like it's giving me the log. So that it, that's precisely what has happened is, um, what is this called? So I can type which, and it tells me where it is. I can look at it, and it'll probably have been a utility written by Elbert. You know, G. Arlick, whoever that is, wrote it. Looks like pretty old utility, 1996. Uh, but you can see it's just a shell script that someone wrote. And you see here's a du command. They're op they're putting a couple options here. Here's sorting. They're sorting in reverse order numerically. Um, so this is looks like someone's just tried to what I just described a simple version of. Someone's created a complex version and made it a script that you can run. Yeah. This is a question about assignment seven. Um, it says right here that each class should have two member functions, a constructor and a display. What's the display again? Uh, so assignment seven should have a constructor and a display. A display is a function that prints out either the time or the date, respectively, depending on the class. So if you look at Deleted it. Um, I'm going to let that sit. Learn .csu Chico. How do you? I'm also going to post project two today. Recall that I need you to get the, the handouts to project two, print them out, read them, and bring them to class on Wednesday. Okay, so Wednesday's going to be a big day as far as uh, kicking off another project. Hey, yeah. Um. It also says to put each class declaration in the header file. Does that mean I can put both classes, the date and time class, in the same header file, or do they have to have separate ones? The question is regarding the breakdown. The breakdown's right here. Let me make that a little bigger. So assignment 7.cpp is provided. If I look at the file that's provided, and again, uh, I'll talk about the constructors bit here. So that is what I'm providing to you. This is synonymous with the test program you did for the first project. Creates a date object called DT, creates a time object called TM, 
and then calling the display function here I have in comments this is what it should be putting to the screen 74 1776 and this is what it's putting to the screen 1203 so this would be the hour and the minute this would be the month day and year Yes, indeed. I learn a little bit of history in this class as well. That's just one of the free services I offer. Comedy history class. <clears throat> okay, so let's. Uh, there are a couple things to talk about. One is the display. One is this idea of constructors, which I started in on on Friday, but I want to expand on that today. Any questions on any of this stuff before I dive into it? Yeah. Okay, so that good question that it is how we look at this file that I'm providing. It includes date.h and time.h, but the CPPs are nowhere to be found. And the question is, how in the world does this thing make a cohesive application? So let me step back first and say that uh, I can't edit date.h because I don't have it. Um, this is a class declaration, which means if I was to look at date.h, I'd see class date, open curly brace, there'd be a bunch of stuff, close curly brace, semicolon, right? This is what I've referred to before as the blueprint. So programmers are going to refer to it as the class declaration. Uh, I'm declaring the existence of this class, if you will, but it is in fact a blueprint. And the, the, uh, the key concept to keep in mind with blueprints is they don't take up space per se. It's merely information for the compiler's brain while it's doing things. And here I am. Uh, here is me using date on line 11 and line 13. And the again, I haven't talked about constructors with arguments yet, but the only way the compiler is going to allow line 11 to occur is if I've provided some sort of interface, some sort of public member function, which says that this is behavior that I can do with a date. In this case, this would be a date constructor, a, a function that gets run when I create a date. Here, this is saying that the only reason, excuse me, not this doesn't say, the only reason line 13 works that it compiles is because in date.h, in the class declaration, I said that the date class has a display function spelled the way you see it spelled right this is a totally different function with an uppercase D uh, but somewhere in that class declaration I said date has a display function and it does not take any arguments all right so that's what we're getting in the dot H file what is totally non-existent in any of this stuff that we're looking at here is where is the source code that I wrote for this constructor and where is the source code that I wrote for this member function? In other words, where is the class definition? The class definition is in the .cpp file and the .cpp file doesn't exist anywhere here. And I have said before, and I'll say it again, never, ever, ever, ever do that. Never include a .cpp, okay? So now I turn my attention to uh, Sketchbook Pro or Express. All right, this, this is date.cpp. Hmm. Why am I not? Whoa, that's fun. Uh, I want this. Nope, I thought I wanted that. What's going on here? 
Okay, that's when I just say let's try this all over again. So let's cancel, get rid of that. Oh, okay. There we go. What is that? Oh, there it is. Now it's moving. But. All right. Look what I got for Christmas. I soon I'll know how to use it. All right. Last try. Let's see. Oh, all right. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing anymore. Stop it. On the top, date.cpp. There we go. Now I should shrink it down, but I don't want to tempt fate here, so we're just going to leave that just the way it is. <laughs> and this is time.cpp. I keep hitting return there. And then the other one was uh, assignment 7.cpp, yeah? All right, so these are my three CPP files. Now, I'm going to go to squiggly, squiggly lines here. <clears throat> what I do is I say g++ date.cpp, goes through the preprocessor, goes through the compiler, goes through the assembler and after it goes through these three steps I end up with a dot O. That is a machine readable file but not a working application. <laughs> it's the version of this upgraded recently and clearly they've made some we'll call them enhancements <laughs> <laughs> and now how do I this this needs to move how can I move it if I do that that doesn't work no you see but then it unselected that's what I thought too it's not just me. <laughs> All right. So I obviously need to write a nasty letter to the folks at corporate. Uh, but so we'll do this. Ditto. And ditto. Okay. So. Again, these .cpp files, all three of them have pound includes, where they're including date.h here, time.h here, and including both date.h and time.h and this one here. And all it is is to allow the preprocessor, it sees those include statements and puts a copy of the files into the code that's compiled. The compiler compiles it into assembly language. The assembler turns it into machine-readable code. So I end up with machine-readable code in all three of these, and they happen separately. There's no requirement to compile all these at the same time. You can compile this on Monday, this on Tuesday, and this on Wednesday. And after you compile this on Wednesday, you'll have three .o files. Don't you need a dash c to get the .o? You do need a dash c. So what I need to insert right there is a dash c. And that will run these three and stop at the .o. Okay. Now, once I'm done doing each of these, then my last stage is to, anyone? The linker is run only once, once you have all of your .o files created. And the linker 
we'll take assignment 7.cpp right here. Right here, this will be a call to dates display function. Right here is a call to times display function, and all of this is in assignment 7.cpp. So here, in, the, in this .o file somewhere, there are calls to dates display function and times display function, and the linker is going to link those calls to where the source is over in this .o file. And that's what the linker does, and when the linker is done linking the calls with the source code, you end up with a program you can run. Okay, so that is why you're not pound including CPP files. CPP files are all supposed to be compiled independently. Yes? Um, you can't link .l files with .cpp files? Uh, you cannot link, dot, no, the linker by definition is only going to operate on machine readable files. Not now you thought you did that. So the question is on combining uh, the linker with the CPP and the .o file. So one thing I can do is I can say um, here I can say maybe I say G plus plus minus C and I'm going to do this right, and this will create date .o. Is that high enough for everyone? Uh, I won't run that because I don't have a date.cpp, but if I run this with the dash C, it's going to create a date.o, right? Now I can go ahead and I can do this, g++ date.o time.cpp assignment 7.cpp. And what will happen is the compiler will first see this and say nothing to be done. Then the compiler will see this, and it will do the first three steps to get a time.o. And then the compiler will see this, and will do the first three steps. G++ will see this, and do the first three steps to get assignment 7.o. And then G++ will call the linker on all three .os, this date.o plus the two it created for these. Yeah, I wouldn't even call it a mistake. So it, it, we colloquially refer to G++ as a compiler, and in even and that's not something we're doing in 111. All programs everywhere are calling it the G++ compiler. But in fact, what G++ is is it's a framework to manage these four steps, and the compiler is actually a separate little program that runs. Yes. On that last change, you are saying time.cpp and assignment seven.cpp get a dot. They get the dotos like red, and then they get linked to the date dot o. But like, you didn't have a minus c to create a dot o for time dot cpp. No, and and so if I if I go back. I, I don't. Uh, and the assumption is G++, if I don't provide any options, the assumption is that G++ thinks that when uh, you hit return, you expect an executable to be created. So it will intelligently examine each one of these to decide which steps to do. Now, even if, even if I do this, so if we step back to before we're dealing with the dash C and all that, the, the G++ will run three steps to create a date.o and it will run three steps to create a time.o and it will run three steps to create an assignment 7.o and then it will run the linker on all three .os to create an executable. We're just not seeing it because it's all happening under the hood. Okay. Yeah. What was the difference between doing this and what we did with assignment 4 for the um, hexagon? Well, you, you, you gave us the uh, dot so I gave you, for assignment four with the hexagon, I think I said uh, you need to do your the code you write. Was that assignment four? CPP. And I said also use my file. I think that's what I had you do? Yeah, yeah. And because what you were doing is you had a number of calls to code I had written here, number of function calls, the move right by and the move forward and the move backward. Right. Those are all functions that I wrote. And they were in this in this file here. So what happened was, uh, the only reason you were able to compile your code is you pound included hexagon.h, and hexagon.h contained all the function declarations, or the other word being function prototypes, for the functions I had written. 
exact exact same architecture, right? None of the source code was in hexagon.h, just the, the declaration saying, hey, I've got a function called turn right by, and it takes an integer as an argument, and it returns void. And then all the source code was here. In my own, if you looked at hexagon.cpp, you would see that I include hexagon.h, just as when you write date.cpp, you're going to write a date.h. And you see the beauty, so you see that the beauty of, of this design is that once you write date.cpp, uh, then you have date.h in any application in the world. All they have to do is pound include date.h to write code to your date class, and they just have to make sure that on the compile line they have your date.cpp. Uh, so that, that's what's happening here. Then it all gets compiled and linked together. The, the, the only uh, other note I'll make is that uh, you'll hear the term libraries quite a bit. And what a library is, is it's code someone has written and has compiled for you down into a .o. That's what a library is. So they've, they've written a bunch of code. So if I was to do this uh, with a more advanced class, what I would have done is I would have compiled hexagon.cpp myself into a .o, and I would have turned it into a library. And I would have said, in order for you to use my hexagon code, you need to pound include hexagon.h, and you need to link into my library. Okay. That's how I would phrase it. And you would never need to see hexagon.cpp, because I would have already provided the .o. All I would give you is the .o in the header file. Uh, good question. Where is IO stream and stuff getting its .o files? Because C out, C out is actually a C++ object created from a class called O stream. So the, the people that wrote the standards for the language created a class called O stream, O meaning an output stream, and all, a whole bunch of member functions for what you can do with a, an output stream, and they created an object called C out. There's a line of code somewhere that someone wrote that said O stream C out, just like you say date DT or web counter WC, right? That, they all compiled down into a .o and put it into a standard C++ library. And where it is, uh, I can't tell you offhand exactly where it is. It's in, a, it's in a standard location on the system. And one of the things that G++ is doing under the hood is it's linking to the standard library code without us having to do anything. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you said when you compiled the uh, C++ to um, the C files instead of the dash o, or um, instead of linking them all with dash o's like they're supposed to, but if you just link the C++ instead of make the dash o's, does it actually make the files Oh, right. So the question is, if this is making the dot, the dot .o object files, why aren't we seeing it? Why aren't we seeing the dot .o files? Yeah, yeah that, that's a fair question. What happens is there's a temporary directory, which is slash temp. And uh, what happens is G++ does compile with the dash C option. It puts the dot .o files in this temporary directory. And then it links them all together. And once it's linked into an executable, it goes back into that temporary directory and removes the .o files. Okay, so no one actually sees them. So you'll never see them. Right. It, it, so it, cre it compiles, creates them, links, removes them. And as fast as a c program compiles, all that occurs. Yes? How do we compile our program or our program using a library? Uh, how, do you pro how do you compile your program using a library? Um, I don't want to talk. I don't want to get it. it, it it's got. A, I got a wonderful lecture for it, but I don't want to spend the rest of the period talking about it. So let me just suffice to say that you can um, say dash l my lib, and the dash l is the option for linking into a library called my lib. There, there's more to it, but that that's that'll give you a bit of a head start. If you look under, uh, our, if you Google archive library Unix or archive library Linux, you'll probably find lots of wonderful tutorials on how to do it. It's actually really straightforward. With uh, 20 minutes of discussion, I can make it so that you can create .o files and create a library. 
Any other questions? OK. So to talk a little bit more about constructors, if we look at this assignment again that's provided to you, here's the, the key weirdness here is that I am actually creating something by providing it arguments. Let me show you a variant that you actually didn't realize that you could do. So I'm going to create uh, ctor code.cpp, and I'll do that. Integer x equals 5, and then I'll say c out x. All right, so this, this is code that hopefully everyone's comfortable with. Here I'm creating x, and I'm assigning it 5, so I should see 5 printing out just for the sake of making sure that everything is where we expect it. I'll run it. There's my 5. No big mystery. Okay. Here's a, a different way that you didn't realize that you can actually initialize x. Let's try it. And there's my 5. Okay. So the, what we see on line 6 and what I've commented out on line 7 are identical. Uh, the reason for me showing you this is so that you get comfortable with the syntax and understand that the syntax is rather generic for C++. And I can create any odd. So I can say float fl 3.14. And now when you look at the code that I provide, it looks something like that. Uh, what I, I don't want to deal with dates since that's on your assignment. So what I want to do is I want to go back to the person stuff that I provided last time. That was on um, that's right, isn't it? Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. Hang on. I'm going to move this directory down to 111s14. I'll dive down in there. <clears throat> and then I'll do that. There. Now I should see. All right. So I need to copy out of here the person.cpp to my current directory and I'll copy person.h to my current directory. Let's look at those real quick. Let's look at this one first. All right, so my person has an age and what I did is I created a constructor that did not take any arguments and I had a display function. So let's look at what I did to write these two functions in person.cpp. And looking at the display function first, uh, pretty standard function, doesn't return anything, so I avoid there. It's part of the person class, the name of the function is display, and all I have is a cout statement, and I print out the age, which is the person's age. Yes, right here. And now the constructor, uh, this is the name of the function. By definition, a constructor always has the same name as the class. Also, the constructor is always called when you create one of these things. So whenever I create a person, a function called person gets run. This stuff here is following. It's a little bit confusing to see the word person twice, but keep in mind this is totally consistent with this right here, right? This is just saying which class this function belongs to. So the display function is part of the person class and the person function is part of the person class. Now I can add another constructor and the interesting thing is uh, I can have more than one constructor. In fact I haven't said this at all. I could have more than one display function or more than one of any kind of function. I just have, if I create more than one function with the same name, 
I have to make sure that the numbers and or types of the arguments are different. So I have no parameters here and one parameter here. It's totally non-ambiguous, non unambiguous is the word I'm looking for. It is unambiguous to the compiler. It'll always know whether it should call this function or this function. How does it know the difference? If you give it a number, all right? So let's look, let's write this function. Person, colon, colon, person. This particular version takes an integer. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to set the person's age equal to that number that's passed in. Now I can run it. Uh, I have to write some code for it. There's that. I'll leave that code there. And let's bring up this. I want to pound include person.h. Okay, I didn't want to deal with date. So I want to deal with person. So I'm going to say person p. I can also create a person r. And this one I'm going to give an age. And then I'll say C out. Um, no, not C out. I'm going to say P dot display. And then I'll try R dot display. What should display here? What constructor got called with uh, P? The one that takes no arguments, right? Like that. It takes no arguments. You leave off the parentheses if it doesn't take any arguments. If I come back here and look with no arguments, I'm going to say, yay, I'm in the constructor, and then I'm going to set age to zero. I suppose I should say in one argument constructor. Let's compile this. I want to compile person.cpp and the ctorcode.cpp. I'm going to run it. And there's the one that ran the constructor that took no information. Here's the constructor that ran and took the one, one argument, the 23. So that's how you write constructors with arguments. If you need more than one argument in here, which you do for time, you need two. For date, you need three. Whoops. All right, just chain them together just like a normal function. Okay, any questions on that? Yes. Yeah, in the five minutes left. <clears throat> Sorry, could you demonstrate how to properly uh, format the uh, time output? Formatting the time output. Uh, yeah, because the issue is that if on the time I set the hour to 12 and the minute to 3, when you print it out, you're going to be printing it like this, and you don't want that. You want output to look like this. Yeah. And there, uh, let me see, what do I want to do? Um, output.cpp. You want to pound include uh, the input and output manipulators. Let me run it and I'll come right back to it. So let's see what the output looks like, and then we'll talk about what's happening here. Okay, it doesn't like that. Hang on. No. Nope. Um, let's try that. That's not going to work, so I'm going to say this. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, oh, damn, i got to look at Google. Google.com. All right, that I used to use to Google.com till the company went under. Um, I want to say IO manip uh, set width and fill. Set fill. Yeah, that's what I have. Set W. Why is that not working? Oh no, 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 no. Is that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I was thinking my problem was with this one as with the other one. All right, compile it, run it, and then I'll describe it. So note, I've got a whole bunch of X, ooh, a whole bunch of X's and a 99 at the end, right? Let's see what that code is. I'm setting the width 
of the field of the next thing I print to 30 characters. That means that the 99 is going to print in a space designed for 30 characters. So that's going to be 28 spaces and then the 99. I can designate a fill character. Instead of having it fill up with spaces, have it fill up with X's. Now I'll leave it as an exercise to the reader on how, if I want to print out a 3, how can I get it to print out a 0, 3? What is the width of my field? And what is my fill character? Yeah. Alright, there you go. Problem solved. The word of the day. That was Friday. Uh, let's see. Is that right? No. Oh, ledger name? Yep. Let me get, here we go. Ledger main. Skillful use of one's hands when performing conjuring tricks. Much of what I do up here. Deception and trickery. Okay. All right, so again, be sure and print out the materials to Project 2, bring them to class, and be sure to read through those materials prior to coming to class, all right? This is project is much bigger than anything we've done before, and it's, so it'll be very important for you to show up to get the most out of it, both uh, Wednesday and Friday are very important classes for succeeding in that project. Uh, your spring break should be pretty mellow.